Welcome, Glenn. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, it's fun. <coughs> Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, Glenn, why don't you go ahead and uh, take it away? I know you got a whole lesson planned for today. If I'm starting this here, I then I'm going to do a start a screen share if I can. Uh, All right. Ta -da, it's supposed to work. <laughs> there is. It works. We can see it. <laughs> okay. I where, where I wanted to start out. Uh, <clears throat> actually, I'm just going to take off. We don't need this to begin with. Is that uh, <clears throat> one of the, one of the first things? Now this is. Uh, one of my drawings. Uh, now, what artist, uh, what we've done, oh, I'm getting tongue tied here. <laughs> okay, the first, the first thing that uh, we go back to, we can go back to the cave paintings. Okay, they were amazing. If you've never been, I taught in France a few years ago. And we got an opportunity to go down into the caves where they look at the paintings. And so <clears throat> when you think of when you think of your cave paintings and you think of animation, you go down into the caves and you take an uh, with a lantern or some kind of light that some of they're, they're very cave, they're like literally caves. You have to go down, sometimes you're down on your knees to take a look at these things. And when you go down there with a light and the light goes over the surface of the rocks, they are actually animating. They really look like they're moving. And so there's a realism, there's a reality to these drawings that, and the, you, 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 look, you can imagine the magic that came from taking and looking at these things. They were really magic. And in a sense, that's what about artists, that's what we are. We're the last of the magicians. Uh, and we try to bring things to life. That's, that's what, it, what we do. But there's a long history of taking and studying animal drawings. Uh, during the Renaissance, uh, everybody lived on horses. They drove, rode horses. They horses. Before that, even, go back to the Greeks. Horses. Okay, so it, it, there was an intimacy and an understanding of the animals. Okay, and that's something that in a way today has been lost. That I know is, I started out uh, teaching animal drawing, well, I guess some 60 years ago. And at that time, I knew absolutely nothing about it. I wasn't even interested in animation. But I was teaching animal drawing for the purpose of taking and drawing something that you don't know anything about. And that was the impetus for me actually teaching animal drawing. Now, primarily at that point, I was the, the students were primarily illustration students. In the fine arts in the 1960s, they were already saying, you don't need to draw, drawings out. Uh, we're just gonna take, and everything's gonna be done abstract. So you don't need to learn how to draw. But professionally, if you wanted to be an illustrator, and it wasn't even a question of animation. I knew nothing about animation. Uh, in fact, the school where I was, they didn't think of animation as being any kind of art. They, they really downplayed it. If you said you were gonna, gonna be an animator, you practically get kicked out of school. <clears throat> and so the things changed, so we lost a lot. But animation, in a sense, has uh, it's created the need to be able to draw. And you can't draw something if you don't know what it looks like. And that's, that's historically. And you go back to, uh, into the Renaissance, the main emphasis was you draw from the inside out. You have to know the internal structure to take and be able to do it. And that was, that was my basic then training. 
of taking and really studying the inside, starting from the inside. Well, when I was teaching animal drawing then, first thing we would do would go to the Natural History Museum and draw scalps. And the taken point out that, you know, just like all the animals, just like we are, they've got two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, ears. We're all the same. Basic anatomy, it's pretty much the same, not that different. So you're always looking for the same thing. So I'm going to go back and we'll take a look at some of the really sort of the classic uh, people. The primary, the primary, one of the big, big teachers uh, is Stubbs. Okay, George Stubbs. Now everybody today we see we we recognize the uh, they've been reprints of a lot of his books, but 1724 to 1806. So he was really one of the big anatomy anatomy people. Now you see reprints, reprints of Stubbs books uh, where he would take and, and build a thing up. But where he started, he was working for a doctor, he started uh, digging, uh, digging up graves for taking and doing uh, drawings, not of horses, but of babies. Uh, for medical reasons. So these books, now here you can see some of his early anatomy books. Well, he took an approach taking and uh, doing anatomy for humans the same way he did for horses. And the thing that made the big thing, and here, here we have doing the same thing for chickens. So this is really the classic, this is really the classic book on uh, animal anatomy. And Stubbs was, uh, he went through it step by step by step, taking and going through and showing all of the elements then. So he was taking, okay, doing humans, he did exactly the same thing. So this is a, a when you start talking about animal uh, anatomy, this is pretty one of the big precursors uh, to it. Because what happened uh, up to the modern times, and we're talking with Degas, everybody else, they use set poses for animals. Nobody, nobody knew really about, or the, the very difficult to take in like a running horse. Okay, the big argument always was how many feet, or if any feet, or actually on the ground. And what happened was that the, uh, where we went from that is we went to, uh, and I'll take in, this is uh, Maybridge. This is, this is the sort of, in the sense, the Bible of animal movement. So what Maybridge did, and this is, we're talking 1887 now, because during the time, say, with Degas and uh, Daumier, everybody else, they had these sort of set poses. And if you really start looking at these things, you realize it was very difficult. They really didn't understand exactly how to the, what, what the animal does. So when we, we look at Maybridge, now this came out, this came by, and he's probably one of those scientists that's the least uh, recognized. And what he did, and it was all because of a bet. Stanford of Stanford University uh, had a bet. I don't, I don't really actually know, remember who it was, but the idea was he had a bet about if a horse had all of its feet off the ground. Well, Maybridge set up a system where he had sequences of strings going across a track. And each one had a camera that would take a time, take a shot uh, as the horse or person walking through would trip the string. Okay, so he went through and all of these animals uh, taking in step by step by step. Now let me take, and in the cover here, you can see a dog coming and jumping. Okay, but he did that for everybody. Here we have the horse. You can see 
you can see how he's taking and going through somebody riding front view, back view. He goes through all of the different gates of a horse, how people stand, how carriages. Uh, so here's now a, a sloth upside. The picture's not upside down. It was an up, upside down sloth taking and going along on a pole. So uh, here we have a, a uh, Cabayar, or Cabayar, I guess this is the South American rat, <laughs> a relative of a rat. But all of, all of these different animals that we go through, taking and showing the elephants, but going through and showing them walking and, or running and including humans jumping. Okay, so this is stuff that I was looking at like I say, this is long before animation for me. Okay. I didn't really get involved in animation until I was 40 years old. And at that time, which is sort of fun because I knew absolutely nothing about it. I didn't know the names, I wasn't particularly interested. But at that point in life, I had my own school and I was, I was burned out and I wanted somebody to give me a check. And so I had uh, students who were working at Disney. And so Disney actually knew more about me than I knew about Disney. And I called them up and I said, well, you know, <clears throat> I'd be interested in coming. Well, oh, come on in. So I just showed them drawings. It had nothing to do with animation. I literally had to go out and buy a book when, they, when I left the office, I bought a book on Disney. I went to the bookstore and bought a book on Disney. And because uh, I didn't know what they were talking about. Because one of the funniest things was that all I knew about animation was that you did the same drawing over and over and over and over to make it move. And to me, that sounded like the most boring thing in the world. And so, what I, so what they asked me is, well, what do you want to do? I said, I don't want to be an animator. <laughs> to me, that sounded like the horrible part of the job. <clears throat> okay. And so so they, what they did is they let me go from one place to the other. But people, before I got there, there were people would say, well, you know, they talk about Milk Hall or Frank and Ollie. And I said, these great draftsmen. I said, Never heard of them. <laughs> Pontormo's a great draftsman. Michelangelo's a great draftsman, but who's Milk Call? He had no meaning to me. Okay. And so, in many respects, I think I had a, a, a real advantage in that my background was completely different. I came to animation with a totally different conception about drawing. But what turns out, it was actually the same thing. And so this is really the beginning. So in taking and teaching animation, drawing, but teaching, just teaching drawing, understanding what it is you're drawing, under, knowing, the, knowing the structure of the animals that you draw. And so that's why I put up this thing is, okay, this is where we take the students. The first thing we would do is we would go to Natural History Museum and drawing, drawing the animals. And the point of taking and really knowing and going from one animal to the next animal to the next animal and understanding what these things were. And in fact, uh, later on, when I, when I did start working at Disney, well, the first show I worked on was the uh, Fox and the Hound. So we had dogs. <laughs> that, that, was, that was, it turned out pretty, pretty funny because the first week, I mean, they didn't, they, they put me, stuck me in a room uh, with the storyboard guys. Uh, Pete uh, Young, who uh, was at that point was the, one of the top uh, story guys. He died very young, unfortunately. But uh, the, the first week, 
they had me sitting down, taking and doing drawings. And uh, that was like on Monday. On, well, on Friday, they had a storyboard meeting. And so we had all these huge boards all over the room. And I had some drawings up on the thing there. And I thought it was so humorous that, okay, we had we, we, people that came in for the meeting was in the meeting where my room, the room I was in, I was on the other side of a desk with Blue and Pete. And we had uh, Wolfgang Ritterman, who was the producer, director, not director, but producer, Frank and Ollie, Eric Larson, uh, and a whole batch of things. And they were going through the story thing. And I thought well, he was humored. The average age is probably 60 or something like that. Okay, and to me, it was like watching, watching these guys get down and going through and acting out the animals taking and doing things. Uh, to me, it was hilarious. And so I had this drawing up on the wall, an old Wolfgang Ritterman with this cigar that he wasn't allowed to smoke anymore. But taking off, he says, what, what's that terrier up on the wall? Well, the terrier, which is supposed to be a fox, was my drawing. Okay. Believe me, the next day I could draw a fox. <laughs> uh, but you're taking a learning, learning, learning the, the intricacies. And this type of thing came through uh, even for many of When I went to Cal Arts, I was teaching Cal Arts, in fact, I was head of the department for a while, is that we had to bring animals in. We'd have all kinds of stuff. Uh, also, I was teaching a, a class for rhythm and hues, and they were doing the the show the Babe. Okay, there I would bring because I live in the country. I had a big stock trailer at the time, and I would bring animals into things. And even in the Fox and the Hounds, I brought in a bunch of geese and stuff for for the studio because those are some of the animals that we had. We had pigs. And the thing, so I brought these animals in to take and teach drawing class, animal drawing class. So I was already the minute I started working in the studio, I was teaching at the same time. And but like I said, I was forty years old. I'd been doing this for a long time already. And so one of the things was that when I was doing with the, the with the ducks, okay. One of the things I did not know anything about was expressions. Never dealt with expressions. I learned real fast. <laughs> okay. Because that's what we did with. That was the, the everything's about the, the emotion, the feeling, the attitude of what you're dealing with. So taking in these were sort of uh, playing with trying how do you how do you bring an expression to a duck and, and basically a realistic duck and just that subtlety of the turn of an eye or a curl at the end of the mouth you start to give an attitude the turn of the head those are things well that's gesture well, that's no different in a sense than regular figure drawing and the actual approach to doing the drawing very, very similar. I, I didn't. I never changed. Uh, approaching drawing the animals, I exactly what I did, uh, taking and, and drawing humans. And in fact, it was sort of uh, interesting because once I started uh, working at Disney, I, they had me teaching figure drawing also. So I was taking and learning and teaching at the same time, which was a great opportunity for me. I, I learned so much new stuff, constantly learning new things. So, and I'm just gonna take and show a series of drawings now. Here, here you can see taking and, and playing and playing with the expressions a little bit. But one of the elements that we, uh, deal with in animation, of course, we have to construct the figures. But we have to understand, we have to understand the animals three-dimensionally as well as two-dimensionally. And so, <clears throat> but as they're doing like, this was uh, 
he said, we had horses. Now this is one of the horses, but here you can see, I'm taking and studying, actually thinking about the, how the ligaments of the horse are, uh, the hoof, the, on the back, studying the bones, which way they go. I have, I have a fairly good collection of uh, uh, different uh, skeletons and stuff. Uh, but even here, looking at the kangaroo, you can see sort of the basic, the basic elements now. Of now, these would go once we had gone take I would take the class, and we would go to the Natural History Museum. Then we would go to the zoo. And well, actually, take the steps that I would do in teaching. We would draw the skeletons, and then we would draw the stuffed animals. I do the same thing when I've been teaching in Vienna or in Paris. Go to the Natural History Museum. We do do go through the same cycle because I'm still teaching animal drawing, but uh, a lot of the people are not necessarily animation oriented. They're just there's this artists that want to be able to take and draw uh, animals. And today, of course, so much, it's almost everybody is taking and working from photographs. Now there's nothing wrong with working from photographs as long as you can use the photograph rather than having the photograph use you. And that you need to take and be able to look at a photograph as a reference. The great photograph is a great sketching tool. Because a lot of times, particularly with animals, they're not going to sit there for you. They're going to be go all over the place. And you then, and then need to be able to take and have an approach to taking and drawing them. And usually you're doing many drawings at the same time. So like here, dealing with the uh, kangaroo is, no, that's a typical animation type of blocking in. Uh, they're going through and developing them and trying to look at understanding how they go through. So from very, very simple forms. So, uh, but a lot of times you take and you get a little bit more advanced, you start looking at them. And now these are, most of the drawings that I'm showing are all done from life at the zoo or my backyard. Uh, but we're taking and drawing, drawing the animals. Like one of the good things, I, I don't think I have to show you, but is a, you draw a giraffe. A giraffe doesn't look like a giraffe without its spots. Uh, so we build these things. This is the, uh, okay, a boar. And Another element that I find that uh, the student is really needs to take and spend more time at is being a little bit more adventuresome in the materials that they use. Uh, today, I use a, a draw. I still draw an awful lot with a pen, probably more than even with a pencil. And, but I also use a water brush. So I coming in and taking in combining, well, these are fairly modern tool now. And so I can create tones and stuff, but these are drawings I've done over the years. I'm just sort of grabbing things here. Okay. Now these, now this is a, a, when we go to the zoo, the first place we go is to take and go to the animals uh, petting zoo where the kids are. Okay, so now we're talking about taking and dealing with the live animals, but if you take the guys like really classical uh, animal drawing, this is Carl uh, Rungus, 1869 to 1959, so he's pretty, pretty recent. Okay, now he was a great or outdoorsman. He would go out into the woods in, in uh, the North Coast, well, the West Coast, I should say, going to California and into Canada. But he would go out and he was a hunter. So when you're taking and doing a moose, you go out and shoot the moose and then hang it up. And so it's not gonna move, okay? So 
this is a, a Rungus who's a, a really an amazing uh, guy. When you look at his stuff, now here's we're talking about anatomy. Here you can see now he, where he's taking and skinned the animal. Now this is a cat, okay? But he skinned it and he's drawing it, have you? Okay, drawing dead horses. Okay. Well, okay, that's one of the things when we were talking about Stubbs. Stubbs took and actually, he had to do this out in the country. He had to uh, hang up a horse and then he would take and start taking it apart layer by layer by layer. And he was out in the country because of the smell, the whole really bad. And he just have a pit underneath this where the pieces would just fall down. And so we don't appreciate the effort that these artists did to be able to give us take the information. And artists did the same thing when you're talking about human anatomy, okay, taking and building, building them from the skeletons, okay. So these are marvelous uh, examples. Now here, now here the, now here we, what we have is a combination of the, somebody that could really draw and basic pencil technique. It, it's a marvelous renditions of thing, and. Here, looking at the uh, cubs, uh, well, a lion and its cubs, the skull. Now oh, I have a big uh, saber-toothed tiger, not a saber-toothed, I think a Siberian tiger skull myself that I've drawn many times. And I've got a whole drawer in fact. <laughs> By teaching, what I do, I've got acquiring skills. I was teaching a, an animal drawing class at home. And I had the class out there. I can't remember what I had out there. I guess I meant to have a, uh, probably a horse. And the students were taking and drawing this. And a friend of mine comes running up and he says, I got a fresh roadkill for you. And it was something that it, it, it's not squashed. It, it just got banged with something. <laughs> so here I've got this fresh roadkill to take and uh, skin and to take and clean it up <laughs> and get the skeleton. Uh, but then the same thing, we like to say, I live out in the country. And in another case we had where somebody comes up and says, hey, here, we got this, I, we just butchered a, 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 a a large pig, so here's the head. He gave me this head on a platter. And I said, oh, cool, I can take and do this. And the owner said, no, you're not doing this inside my house. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to take and skin this and get the skull and stuff. So you're going through all of these things, but it, you know what it is, it's curiosity. That's what it comes down to, is you're taking, you're looking at things and you're trying to understand how it works. And that, that was my impetus to start with. I said, you start to draw a dog or a cat, I don't know anything about them. And so when I first uh, was taking and drawing horses, I didn't know anything about horses. My wife was a horse person. When I was a student, the cliche was that all girls could draw horses and the guys could draw cars. <laughs> it was the two things. That's what they knew. Okay. And so that, that was a part of the whole process that we would go through. So taking and uh, look at this. So it's a guy, but he was, Rungus was a really a good painter. Okay. Now here we've got the, you can see where he's taking and he had this, in here we have a, a wounded moose. Well, if you look at the head here and the head over here, it's the same head. He would use these materials again and again, but these are, he would work from a stills, uh, still life. In other words, the thing would be taking and not moving when he do, he'd do the drawings of from the real animals. And then he would also take and do 
uh, very, very careful photographs now, for instance, here, photographs using the different uh, things to be able to put in the background. He would also take and do very, very careful paintings. Now, now look at the action that he's getting into this. Okay. So he's a very strong understanding of the movement of the animals. He, and this is really comes down to taking and being very, very involved in understanding uh, and being social, this is being involved with animals. Now, I say, okay, I have horses. So I'm pretty familiar now. I've really started, st I studied them, I've ride them, or I have rid them a lot actually. And so there's an intimacy that you have. I go down there and feed now. And I go down with the grandchildren and let them feed and clean the corral while I draw them. <clears throat> and so you really get an understanding. We had uh, half a dozen goats in our yard uh, last year and chickens until the coyotes got them. <clears throat> so, but it's a, a thing that we do. So taking and so taking and drawing the horses of taking time and really analyzing and studying. Okay, so another, here's, let me show you another uh, artist. This is uh, Frank Calderon. Now he actually set up the uh, uh, UK uh, uh, school of uh, animal drawing. And it was a, he was the head of it. And uh, this, is, uh, this was published in 1936, the year I was born. Now, he makes a very nice, he, in, this, in, in, in this, now I use this because he's really, he really goes through, this is my, in a sense, my, my sort of uh, Bible on animal drawing. Because it goes into very, very careful detail of things. But he starts out, he starts out the, the book on how to draw the animal. And the first thing that he does is he says, okay, first you have to take and uh, have somebody tie it up and hold it still for you. And then how do you hold the pencil? And he goes through all of the different steps that you go through in doing the drawing. But he was basically analyzing, but he makes a statement that once you un understand the internal structure of it, that your basic understanding of anatomy will pretty much carry through. But without the underlying, underlying structure, it's very, very difficult to take and apply all the points to it. Then you start adding muscles, but we, same muscles. If you have to understand what's inside first, and then you take and you add to it, and then you can extrapolate and build on it. So this is this is a, a really good book. This is a, uh, I think it's a Dover book. So I, you know, I'm, it's still, a, I'm sure available. But he, uh, he, when you really get it down into drawing the animals, okay, this is not for animation, but it all applies, it's knowledge. Uh, and that's what you what you need. Knowledge is uh, you have to understand what you're what you're drawing. And you have to have a sympathy for them. Okay, so the, the other uh, then as we start moving forward, this one uh, I actually had this guy worked at Disney, uh, but it, uh, Ken Holtegren. And taking and drawing, but he he primarily was a comic book artist. He worked at Disney. He was an animator, but he spent so much of his career taking and doing the comics. And so he's but he so he one of the things that he comes up and comments on is that the three things. One is that you have to take and you have to understand the animal. Okay. Uh, then you be, have to be able to understand the action of the animal. And then he talks about character. 
And so being able to take and turn that animal into a character. And of course, that's what we do in animation. We, we take and we bring it to life, but the same kind of basic simple structure, movement. Uh, so these are really simple, straightforward type thing. Again, construction. And so if you take and you start breaking down, it's analytical construction with movement and feeling. <laughs> That's what we do. And so that you're looking at some of these drawings that I go through. It's take, this is one of the things I try to get, we go to the zoo and this is the uh, fun is the taper. The baby was born while I was there. It was so cool. And I'm able to sit there and draw. But then the people, the people are sometimes more, we're animals. So I'm drawing the people at the same time as I'm drawing the animals. And it's, uh, monkeys, stick them, same thing. You build it up again here. Okay. You're drawing and drawing the people. These were, I did with my class there, we were drawing elephants up on the top there. And so I'm drawing the people as well as the animals. And then composing it is the best. Now, here again, the goat. Now you can see the very just careful construction, thinking of the anatomy and how it builds, how the, how the parts are. So these are all, all the basic, basic elements that we have to take in and, and work with. Uh, now, the beginning part is the gesture. Like, okay, here, now I'm using the gesture approach to drawing the skeleton. And that allows for a, I, in other words, I don't, even if, even if I have a, an hour or two hours of something to draw, I do it exactly the same way. I start with the feeling, the feeling of how it goes, the simple structural elements. And as you're approaching this, like drawing from a skeleton, it's exactly what I would do in, in taking and uh, doing a, a little piece of staging out for even a layout. Monkeys, taking in, again, no different than taking and dealing with humans. We're all the same. We're all the same. Uh, and here, sort of a lion. I think Aaron will do. He show you more about lions than me. <laughs> again, again, looking at now, taking and understanding how how does how does what how does an ear? How do you construct an ear? Really looking at it, well, how do you, how do you, how does that work? And building a thing. Uh, one of the areas that most people have difficulty, they don't, because they don't know, is that the where, where is the structure? Where's the rib cage? Where's the rib cage on a giraffe? Now, we tend to look at it and think of it as it, it, something different than it really is. So you're taking an understanding and building the animals and uh, focusing on like, So each, each of these drawings then is taking and construct. Here, it's taking, constructing, constructing, constructing. And like I said, we had, uh, last year we had, uh, I think seven and uh, seven goats. Uh, and I, in fact, I was doing, I have drawings, videos I did where uh, drawing of the goats in the backyard eating the roses. <laughs> okay. uh, but we have, it's, 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 they're fun, fun goats I find that are, are, are great, great animals to start with because they, uh, they're so exaggerated in, in all of their shapes. And where they go, you can see the structure, you can feel the whole thing. These are some of the, some of the goats. Again, 
and they're playing. Notice here now I took in and drawing them with, uh, uh, with the red. Well, in the studio, I would have been using color erase blue and then building it from there. <clears throat> so uh, the technology, the technology as we take, you know, as, as we work with these drawings. Now, here you can see capturing a quick gesture, the guy sitting back. Uh, so today I don't have any goats, but I have friends, uh, people down the street who've got a half a dozen goats that I can go down and draw anytime I want. Uh, but when I was teaching animal drawing regularly, I, I, at the Animation Guild, I taught animal drawing for a number of years. And the first thing I would do, and they, they, they finally told me, I can't do this anymore, <laughs> is I would take and go out and rent. I mean, I actually rent a 30 mice. And we would take the mice and we bring them into the studio. The reason they told me I can't do that anymore because they got away. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd end up with mice uh, running around in the studio. And that, that, that was a no-no. But I find that taking and drawing, drawing, drawing mice, taking and just taking and playing. So you hand, hand out, uh, Probably I've stopped doing it also here at, at home because uh, it got away. We've had too many mice in the house for, <laughs> as it is type thing. Okay, so, but if you take them, uh, I've had the, the people in the studio do this, where they take and they will have a little plastic container and they will have a hamster or they have a mouse and they have it on their desk. So that they can constantly see see this animal that's moving and building and working with. And so that, again, it's the constant involvement with the animal that is a, a real necessity uh, with what we deal with. So it's being able to draw the animals, being, being comfortable with them. Like I said, during the, my own training, the 1960, 62, they were saying drawing was out. Nobody draws anymore, you get it, you know, unless you're an illustrator. Well, I was sort of stubborn. <laughs> and I didn't want to, I, you know, as a painter, uh, people didn't draw, but I, I wanted to draw. I'm a drawer, okay? So I continued on taking, studying and teaching animal drawing, but mostly to illustrators. And so, uh, even when I uh, started working at Disney, then I would have private classes that I would teach on Saturday or at the Animation Guild. I would take in teaching animal drawing. And so I sort of evolved into this whole process into animation, but it really wasn't any different than I, I, all I had ever done. And it's really the things in the past, if you take and you look at the artists of the past, you look at the Da Vinci, you look at the, 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 the all of the other different artists, the, the, the Degas, uh, these evolved a whole different sense of Lautrec. The, the Lautrec, by the way, uh, was actually trained in drawing animals by a top-notch uh, military uh, uh, animal drawer. And so he was really very, very skilled at drawing horses. But he would take and deal them as more of a caricature almost. Uh, they were set pieces. They were just part of the decoration or part of the composition. And so there's one gal, I mean, I, if I have to take and bring this up. This is a woman artist who, if you ever go to the Metropolitan Museum in New York, uh, let's see. These were I was going to take and show some of these things. Let's we can get in tight here. Okay. Uh, a lot of this, it's interesting. It was a lot of the Dutch artists uh, were uh, really 
Okay, here, here, you, here you have uh, Da Vinci. And uh, Guy and the Younger, but look at the, the idea, the expressions already that we're taking and looking at. So we can see, you can see the play now. Okay, the Pentormo, Albert Durer. So, now this is interesting. Durer, he was, and a lot of people don't realize that, he was, a, he was actually a big influence on a lot of the Italian artists, uh, guys like Pentormo. But here you can see a, really an observation type of drawing. All right, uh, so I just think maybe show a couple other, this is a boar. Oh, these, are, these are drawn from life at the zoo. And some more. So, okay, Aaron, do you wanna take, and let's, let's, what do you, why don't you, why don't you take over? Sure, I would love to. And first of all, thank you, Glenn. <laughs> I love your drawing so much and there's always so much life in them. And that's what, I mean, that's what it's really all about when we talk about drawing animals. And uh, um, it's everything that you've said already, I'm just gonna sound like a broken record because it's the same advice that I always give and it really comes down to observation. So many people can draw, like you said, horses or can, or can draw people, let's start with people. You know, I can draw the human figures because we, we draw the human figure all the time. We are human. We see each other all the time. And so many people ask me, well, Aaron, how do you, how do you draw animals? Well, you look at them a lot. You observe them. You go out and you watch them move. And it's, you know, it's not, it's not like you just sit down and all of a sudden just start drawing animals. You have to understand how they're made. You got to, like Glenn said, from the inside out. And um, my biggest, my, the biggest light bulb that went off for me when I started, when I was young, when I was a kid, and I was looking at body parts, and just like you were talking about, Glenn, I'd, I'd pick up roadkill that wasn't too smushed, and and I would draw it, and I was finding that you know they all we all have the same parts. That that was the biggest thing that you know when I started understanding a comparative anatomy, that a bat is basically a hand like this, and a bird is like this, and and a whale is like this, and we're all we're all we all have the same parts. They're just in different proportions. So that what that allowed me to do is when I'm sitting down and I'm drawing like a goat, for instance, like uh, Glenn was doing, I know a goat has a shoulder. I know a goat has an elbow. I know a goat has a wrist. I know a goat has a knee and hips and all these things because I have them. And then it's just a matter of understanding where they are and how they're put together and that sort of thing. I've got a, um, I've got a, a, a really quick uh, keynote some of, the, uh, some of the people in the audience that I recognize some names like Erica Bay um, have seen this before, but I wanna put it out there anyway. Um, let, me, let me share my screen real quick. I uh, forgot to do that first. There we go, there. And here we go. So now what I wanna do here is I wanna first of all get to the beginning. I just, want to do that. There we go. I'm sorry, I'm a little oh, ill-prepared. I was listening to Glenn and uh, wasn't paying attention to my own stuff. So these are just, these are all little sketches of my own. I, you know, I'm constantly keeping sketchbooks and going and drawing, whether they're little scribbles or, or you know, straight up observations. Because when you're drawing from life, every time you draw from life, you are recording uh, you're creating a recording in your brain. You're filling up your your visual library. You know the place that you can pull from later on because you've seen it, you've observed it, and if you do it enough, then it does become uh, something that you can do from your mind. After a while of observation, after you do this over and over and over again, you can later come back and you can start drawing things from your head. But it really does take that time of observation and drawing from life. And, a lot, and the other big question I get from people is, well, if I can't, what if I can't draw you know, an animal from life? What if I'm stuck someplace else or, or whatever? Um, are photographs okay? And you know what, photographs, 
photographs lie a lot. And so I always tell people your next best bet is doing video. Look at video if you're really stuck, because at least you're seeing an animal move. You're getting to see it from different angles and its, and, and its volumes and all kinds of stuff. But look at these. I mean, these are just very quick scribbles. But what I'm looking for, I'm looking for anatomy. I'm looking for character. I'm looking for a lot of different things in these little sketches. And so, you know, a lot of times, you know, the anatomy won't be quite right. The proportions won't be quite right. But it's the act of doing it and the act of, of you know, recording it that will burn into your brain you know, the different parts of, of what's important. And then you can, you can uh, supplement that later on with vi video or photographs or things like that. I, you know, I, I go on safari all the time. I shouldn't say safari, but I, I'm in the woods all the time and I'm photographing constantly. And um, because I, you know, I want to keep a catalog of reference material as well, but I supplement that reference material with the most important part, which is drawing from life, burning all of this stuff into my brain, okay? These are all drawings that I did in England. All these sketches that you're gonna see, they just come from all over the world because I carry my sketchbook with me everywhere. It doesn't matter where I go, I've got it you know, with me at my side and I'm always sitting down and sketching. These are big shire horses that I was able to draw while I was in Manchester a couple of years ago. Really great, great time there. This was in Spain where I was painting wild flamingos out in this marsh. Um, I had a little watercolor set with me. Um, just all kinds of different things. This was a, 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 a horned owl from a, uh, a bird center where I got to sit down and just sketch it. And he just really didn't move. So I was able to draw him, you know. So lots and lots of digital paintings as well. Um, I love playing with light, you know, thinking about the form of the animal and how light plays on them. Then you, then you can start getting into drama and everything else. And so um, this is a place I went to um, years ago when I was directing Brother Bear. Um, I went to McNeil uh, State Park in Alaska, which is one of the highest concentrations of grizzly bears in the world. And uh, I camped there for several days with my friend, uh, Tim Hodge, who is story artist on the movie. And we hung around bears every single day and in the wild and went out and drew them and photographed them and filled sketchbooks. And, you know, and so to this day, I, I've got those memories burned into my brain. So these are all just sketches and, and digital paintings of mine that I've done over the years but it all does boil down to that, that first thing, which is observation. So these are, when I go out to draw, um, I've kind of put together this presentation of the things that I keep in mind, the things that I've learned from others and just discovered on my own as well um, to, keep, to keep your, your, your juices flowing and your creativity going. These are the things that I keep in mind for, for good animal drawing. First thing is I don't even draw. I just go out and I observe. I just sit there and I look and I look and I look and I watch the animal. A lot of times you might be in a zoo and that animal's pacing back and forth. Well, I'm using that time to just look at the proportions, look at the, the, the movement, look at all the different things um, that I'm gonna need to know before I start to, to draw. The other thing that I do before I go out is just try to get to understand the basic anatomy of the animal that I'm drawing. You know, um, we are, like I was saying earlier, we all have a lot of the same parts, but each animal is, is proportioned differently. So if you're gonna go to the zoo and you know you're gonna be drawing elephants or you know you're gonna be drawing lions or whatever it might be, look at the anatomy on those animals first before you go out, study up on it a little bit. And that will help you when you actually start to observe and start to draw the animal. Understanding that, you know, what, what Glenn was saying, understanding what's happening underneath is so important. You don't need to understand every fine detail of every muscle, but understanding the, the, the bone groups and the masses and the muscle masses on top of those 
bones and how they can uh, uh, contract and move and slide over um, bone and that sort of thing. Those are all things that really help with your animal drawing. Now, this is a thing that I do. Um, I, it's, it's a literal, I take, I literally take a mental picture. What I mean by that is I have this technique, especially when an animal is moving around a lot, I'll look at the animal and then look away really quick. Look at the animal, look away really quick. And what that does is it burns an image into your brain. And it's sort of like you see that last frame when you look away, you see that last frame in your brain and then you sketch really quick. Here's a, this is an example right here. This is some, uh, I was in Yellowstone National Park a couple of years ago with my son, Dustin, and he was taking video. And as I was, as, as so he taking video of these bison and I was drawing, and this is the technique I was, I was using while I was drawing these bison. And so I wanted to show you the video and then just show you the drawings that, that came out of, I, I never did the, these drawings from the video. These are all done from life, but I want you to see kind of the accuracy of what you can get. So here's the, here's a, a bunch of bison down by this river. They get spooked and they start to run. So while this is happening, I'm looking and looking away and looking and looking away and really quickly sketching and letting that get burned into my brain. And so after that, this is what I was able to sketch. And so if you already understand the proportion, if you under, already understand basic anatomy, then you can just get these really quick um, gestures burned into your brain. And it's, you know, like Glenn was talking about earlier with the, with the cave paintings, um, you know, these are people that lived with these animals every single day. They saw them every single day. And so that's why they were able to paint them you know, so accurately because it, it, it all came down to observation. Watch your proportions. This is, this is just like anything else. It, you know, you want to know how big, how big is the head compared to the body? How big is the body compared to the tail and, and those sorts of things. So as I'm making these observations of pose and movement and that sort of thing, I'm also looking at how everything measures up. And that comes down to proportion. I look for big shapes first. What does that mean? Well, you know, in this case, here's a sleeping lioness. It's a big oval shape with a flat bottom on it. Don't get caught up in little details right away. And then from there, start to break it down. You know, here's a, this is a little article that I did for Boys Life magazine on how to draw bears. And it really does come down to, you know, thinking about those simple shapes, like a sphere with the, with the snout attached to it. And when you can think in that way, then you can start moving it around from different angles and build your details on top of that basic shape. That really helps a lot. Now, another technique that I have, especially drawing animals that are foreshortened, that you wanna show depth, is I break the body up into sections, usually six different sections. And that is the head, the neck, the front shoulders and legs, the body, the, the pelvis and back legs, and then the tail. Now, what's interesting about that, the way that's broken up is that uh, thinking about it this way will also help your posing. And once, it, once again, it, this comes down to anatomy. When you break it up in this way, you're breaking it up literally into alternating flexible and rigid sections of the body. So if you start at the head, obviously the head is rigid. It's a hard, the skull is hard, but then the neck, is where it's the, the next thing is flexible. When you get to the shoulders, between the shoulders, those vertebrae are, are rigid, they don't bend. And so that's, that's a, a, a stiff point. But then between uh, the shoulders and the, the hips, the pelvis, you've got a flexible part of the body there in the spine. And then from the hips back to the base of the tail, once again, that becomes rigid, that section. And the reason I point this out is if you start showing, let's say somewhere be behind the hips bending, then you're gonna, it's gonna look wrong because you know that, that you're, you're forgetting that there's a pelvis there. Or if you're doing the same thing up around the, sh the, uh, the shoulders, okay? So that type of thing will really help with your posing, but it also really helps, like I said, with foreshortening. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
stay loose. Don't get stuck in, in, you know, trying to hit those details so quickly. So many people will sit there and start really kind of chiseling all the little, all the little details and the, and, and, and whatnot. But if you can sit down and just keep it really loose, let the drawing flow, find that gesture, find the, the heart of that drawing first, then you can build on top of it. Okay. That's the, that's the key. It's, it, you know, staying loose, being, doing the gestures. It's like a, a foundation for a house. You can't, you can't have the house without the foundation. And that's what you need to do with your drawing. You got to start with that foundation, which is staying loose and starting with that gesture. These are all, all these drawings are examples of how I usually start when I'm sketching. After, while you're doing that and after, you want to find that flow. You want to find the rhythm. These are sketches of elephants that I did. I was directing a movie called The Legend of Tembo. Uh, it was about, a, it was an elephant movie. And I wanted people to understand that even elephants, even the, you know, even though elephants are big and bulky and clunky and giant, they still have gesture. They still have elegance. They can still have fluidity and grace to them. And so these are examples of trying to find that that gestural flow through the body. So even something as big and, and, and seemingly ungraceful as an elephant can still have beautiful gesture. Obviously you can find it with cats, but you can find it with every animal that you sit down and, and draw. Understanding locomotion from, a, from an animation standpoint, um, and you don't have to be an animator, you don't have to sit down and you know know every bit of, 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 a, of, a, or a, or a, a run cycle or a walk cycle or a trot or anything like that. But if you understand the basic principles of where the, the placing of the feet should be at any given time during movement, then it makes your posing when you're, when you're drawing from life or, or uh, actually drawing from life or drawing from your mind, it makes it that much more accurate, okay? It just gives you more accuracy more validity, uh, uh, believability to your posing. Once again, this is from the uh, Boys Life article that I did. And, um, and so when you're watching these animals move, um, pay attention to where their feet are placed at any given time. It's, it's you know, you want to, you want to see, you know, how that, how that locomotion works. Now, um, going back to the, the way I break up the animal into six different sections, um, I use those sections, uh, to, I, I use overlapping shapes to keep the drawing from flattening out. And I do it with those, those sections. So let's go back. Uh, here we are looking at a leopard. And if you look at the head, this is one color, the neck, another color, the shoulders, the body, the hips and the back legs, and then the tail. Those sections, um, not only are they the alternating flexi flexible and rigid areas, but they're also the main chunks of area that you want to overlap. And so that really helps give your, your, your drawing depth and space. Here's another one where it's not broken up in, in colors, but you can see how it's broken up, you know, the tail, the hips, the body, the shoulders, the mane in this case with the neck and then into the head. Now here's another one that people will, will forget a lot of times and that's perspective. You know, you wanna understand your perspective. And so, you know, put that animal in a box, put that animal in a plane and, you know, think about it in, as sitting in three dimensional space. Don't forget the ground plane that your animal is, is walking on. Even if you're, if the, the feet are out of frame, you know, you wanna keep that animal grounded in space so that it's still, it's believable. Thinking about silhouette, you know, one of the things we learned as animate as animators is that, you know, with a good clear silhouette, you could tell the motivation of a character or what a character is doing, what's going on, just by silhouette if it's well planned out. You don't want to have to 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 depend on the interior details to tell the story. And so, the better silhouette you have, the better uh, story and, and the clearer drawing you're going to get across. And so these are all examples, once again, coming from my elephant drawing pack on thinking about silhouette and, and the way that I, and the way that I do it. 
the other thing, once again, you can't do it. You can't have this with, you know, without having worked at Disney for so long, or I can't not have it. Um, and that's, you know, looking for personality, you know, even as a kid before I ever thought I was going to be an animator, I always found, I saw personality in the animals that I was creating. I saw emotion. I saw humanity, not necessarily humanity, but I saw, you know, the emotion in there. And, um, and once I got to Disney, that really was pushed. And so even in realistic renderings or semi-realistic drawings like this, um, I try to find emotion. I try to find uh, fear or joy or contentment, whatever it might be, um, and get that across in the, in the image that I'm creating. Um, obviously, when you draw animals, you're going to be drawing fur, right? Well, so many people, once again, they get caught up in drawing every hair. That's not the important part. You're, you're, you're concerned more about the masses and the anatomy. You, can, you don't need to draw every single hair. And you can get across the idea of fur just by tastefully breaking certain planes by showing some hairs coming off, as you can see in this bear standing up. You know, I didn't draw every single hair, but I did show some scruffy areas here and there where I needed to to get across the idea that this animal is completely covered in hair. And one of the things that helps with that is understanding the patterns, the directions that hair grows on animals. When you understand that, that really helps get across that idea as well. When I'm out drawing and sketching from life, um, very, very often I'm, uh, I've, I've got a little watercolor set with me. And I love having that because it really helps with you know, a, 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 especially a very quick gestural sketch, you can throw some color over the top of that and it really pulls it together. So this is, these are sketches that I did uh, back in 2011 when I was, uh, I was in Africa and I went into a, um, uh, an elephant orphanage, the Sheldrick Elephant Orphanage. And, um, and just did these little sketches here and there of these little baby elephants. And they're tiny little sketches, but you know, you throw some watercolor over the top and you know, they, they, they turn out okay. And so that's just, it's a nice little habit to keep. These are all examples of, of all of that. Now, the other thing too that I try to do, at least just for creating uh, more appealing drawings is just looking for the simplicity against uh, 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 complexity or Straights against curves, we always hear about that sort of thing too. It's that it's the same kind of idea. When you have opposing forces, you have interest. And it's the same thing when you have something that's complex against something that's simple. And what I mean by that, if you look at the back line from the nose down along the back of this animal, of this lioness, you get the nice simple line of action all the way down through the tail. It's nice and simple. And then you've got the complexity of the rest of the body. But, and I know that sounds, it sounds like, well, of course it's her back, but you have to purposely think about posing that animal in order to get that, sim that simple uh, line of action through it. So think about that when you're posing your animal. A lot of times I like to work, nowadays especially, all my sketchbooks are, are mid-tone paper because I like to work dark and I like to work light. And it can give your drawings a nice uh, dynamic quality to them. And you can really start to describe form in that way. Um, people always are asking me what, you know, what tools I'm using when I'm using, when I'm doing these drawings. Um, jelly Roll pens uh, come in, a, and it, that's the name of the brand, brand is Jelly Roll. And they come in a white, uh, there's different colors, but you can get them in white. And, uh, and they're great little ballpoint pens. And then the rest of them are just, uh, more often than not, it's just a black bit ballpoint pen but the two of them together re really you know they work great and so that is my basic uh let me jump to my uh, stop screen sharing up here there we go but that's basically what i think about when i'm uh when i'm drawing and it's and i just want to once again reiterate everything that glenn was saying it really comes down to just observation. The more you observe, the more you do it. You know, if you want to be a great baseball player, you play a lot of baseball. Well, if you want to be a great animal draftsman, 
then you draw a lot of animals and you got to get out there and, and observe them. And um, somebody, I would just wanted to show real quick, Glenn, I just wanted to show some books too. You know, here's your Carl Rungus, which you were just talking about. It was absolutely fantastic. One of my favorite art books of all my entire collection. And I've got, as you can see here, this is just a tiny little collection of my animal art books. <laughs> but out of all the books that I have, this is one of my favorites. And I really recommend getting this book if you don't have it already. Um, I believe it's still in print. You can still get a hold of it. I think you can get it through Amazon. But it's the drawings of William D. Barry. William D. Barry was a guy that um, he lived up in Alaska. This is back in the uh, in the 50s that this, these drawings were done. He lived in Denali National Park in Alaska. And, uh, and he would go out and draw. And he just filled his sketchbook, drawing from life, drawing caribou, wolves, bears, all kinds of stuff. And they're just absolutely stunning, beautiful sketches. And uh, so check out that book because that's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's always been a huge inspiration for me. And, uh, and then other, you know, like Glenn was saying, other ways of, of getting in there and understanding those animals from life is if you can find specimens. I had, you know, as you were talking about the, the roadkill earlier, I found a red-tailed hawk one time when I was 15 that had been hit and I took, and it was still, it, was, it hadn't, it hadn't stiffened up yet. So I brought it home and wrapped it up and, and I posed it up on my wall. So John James Audubon used to do this as well. And he posed his birds. <laughs> and uh, I remember doing this big watercolor of this hawk over a period of three or four days until it started to stink. But I entered it into our local art association art contest in Naples, Florida, and I ended up winning because I painted that bird from life <laughs> right from the road. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I wanted to I'll hand it back to Glenn, but I just wanted to throw out some of my uh, advice on how to draw animals a little better. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, we really parallel everything yes. we do. We really do. I have a funny story about uh, roadkills. Like I said, we live up in the, the we're actually surrounded sort of by the, what's called the National Brush. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it's a it's national forest, so we ride our horses up in the hills, and we came across a coyote that had been dead for a while. And I convinced uh, Eleanor to take, and we we rode back, and we walked back, and I had a big sheet uh, that we put this in. We, the mistake I made was I lysoled it, oh. so it killed off everything that any of the bugs. So anyway, for a very long time, I had this half-done coyote <laughs> hanging in the, <laughs> with the tongue hanging out and stuff. Oh, wow. it, 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 it really, even after it had been around for a while, it still smells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I used to drive my parents crazy. We lived in this little trailer out in the boonies, and I without telling them I'd bring home roadkill and I want to get I want to get the bones and so I'd throw it up on the roof because the vultures would come down and clean them up and then I'd climb up on the roof and get all the bones back and go into my room and I'd draw you know yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I well we have had gone through a succession of dogs over the years <clears throat> and so our yard is sort of a burial ground <laughs> right <laughs> I've been tempted. Well, gee, I can go. What you know, he had to be done by now. I can go out there and dig him up. And they, no, no, you can't do that. <laughs> if you guys are both ready, we have a bunch of questions from the chat here. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, our first question comes from Matilde, who's asking: In addition to anatomy, how can we create an animal animation, for example, a walk that feels real? What well, it comes down to. to for me, it, came, it comes down to understanding those mechanics. Once you understand the mechanics, once you study it, whether it's through my bridge or film, where you're breaking down the film and, and you know watching it in reverse, watching it forward, watching it frame by frame. Once you understand those mechanics, the actual physics of how an animal moves, then you can start doing the you know creating it out of your head. You know when we did the Lion King. Um, I watched over and over and over and over again how lions moved, how they ran, how they trotted, how they jumped on each other, how they 
whatever they did and just really drilled those those physics and the physiology of how the how the animals move and and, and everything else you just drill that into your head over months and um and then you know eventually we we're able to just kind of do that out of your head yeah you know i think one of the things that most people don't realize is how much work is involved yeah yeah it's taking like when people say they want to do a piece of animation they say, i get students all the time when it's Oh, I want to take and do a 20 minute animation. I said, <laughs> start with 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Very much. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this next question is coming from an anonymous attendee. And Aaron, I know you kind of covered this a little bit, but maybe both of you could expand. Uh, they're asking, how do you suggest uh, doing fur texture in a drawing or painting without drawing every single hair? Well, I'm for me it's just looking at especially you know if it's short fur then you just find those places like i was showing on the on the bear where you can get a little bit of scruff if it's big long hair like the the hair on a mane of a horse or or on a lion then you're and it's it's just like drawing hair on people you find you don't go right to the detail you find the big shapes first draw those shapes and then you can break it down from there yeah it's basically the same thing is that I, when I'm drawing fur, I use it as a means of describing the structure. That's basically it. <clears throat> Keep it simple. Yep. Um, our next question is coming from Kathleen, who's asking, which key animals would you recommend focusing on to study and learn? Go ahead, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> which key animal? Well, like I said, uh, used to be the day all girls could draw horses. <laughs> the guys could draw cars, but it really, it really depends on what your interest is. Okay, dogs. Uh, I could teach animals. Most people have dogs or cats. That's that's actually a pretty good place to start. Yep. And the basic structure is very, very similar between a dog and a cat. And so the, I would think the dog or a cat would be a good place to start, and then you can expand from that. But to get something that you can get your hands on, and that's like you get a dog, a cat, you can you can grab it, you can feel it, you can sense the bones where they're at, and if it's yours, you're going to have a sympathy for the kind of personality that it has and what it does. So that's that's where I would start for somebody. Absolutely, that that's a. I have nothing to add. That's perfect. And maybe to build off that question, is there an animal that? either of you find yourself returning to over and over again in your drawings? <laughs> I love the big cats. I love, I love big animals. So, you know, big dramatic animals. So obviously I, I, I like drawing a lot of the big cats, bears, um, big game, African themed, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, for me, it's the horses because I have horses in my yard <clears throat> and it's, uh, I'm in horse country. And so that's tend to be where I go a lot. Um, our next question is coming from Ali, who's asking both of you, uh, studying an animal might take a long, uh, a lifelong time. Thus, when or how do you decide to move from an animal to another? <coughs> I, guess, I guess they're asking, um, when do you transition between learning from one animal's anatomy to another animal's anatomy? Well, for me, for me, I don't just go, Okay, I'm going to study a lion and study lion, 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 lion. Now I'm done. Okay, now I'm going to study a dog. Okay, now I'm studying a dog, 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 dog. No, it's we're jump. You jump all over the place. And once you, you know, I was talking about earlier when you understand that comparative anatomy, um, it starts getting a lot easier because you understand that, like four-legged animals, they all have their shoulder blades on their sides. Okay, and uh, as far as um, mammals go. And you're going to start to see the similarities of how they're all built. Then it just becomes a matter of just understanding the nuances of, of proportion and shape. And that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, pretty, I, absolutely. <clears throat> the, you, that's basically where, what originally started teaching was that we're all, we're all alike. You know, always look for the same thing and look for the difference. One of the elements of being able to analyze the animals is what do they eat? 
Okay, in other words, if they eat, whether it's a grazing animal or if they use a predator, which means where the eyes are, which way they look. So that, what do they eat? That, so all, these are all elements that we take and, and have to deal with and also scale. Your house cat is the same as a tiger. It's the scale that makes the difference. Uh, and it depends on how the bones grow because of the scale. Okay. Great. Um, we have another anonymous question who's asking for complex animals like horses, what's the best way to simplify its design for animation? Well, for me, something like a horse, it, it does come down to those, um, you find the gesture which ties the entire thing together, the, the flow, but also, I, 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 going back to that advice I was talking about where I break the animal up into those six parts because it, it gives me that alternating rhythm between rigidity and flexibility. But you also want to keep make sure that you don't, you don't think of it all as separate pieces because it, you, know, you, want to, you want that, that pose to flow. So it's, it's, kind of, it's taking that combination and bringing them together. For me, that helps... Um, simplify you know it'll take you away from you know getting too caught up into the details and so and also once you have that in your head and you're hitting those those gestures from an animation standpoint you can get through that that whatever the movement is that you want to do fairly quickly because you're thinking of it in a much broader way i guess is the way of trying to say it i guess yeah i'm not an animator that's just uh i'm a i'm just Drawing animals, but to, hold, to get the spirit of the animal, exactly the same thing. You've got to, you've got to feel the action and the movement. You have to feel it yourself. Right. Yeah, you can't just copy it. Our next question is coming from Carolina, who wants to hear from both of you how you take the knowledge or information you get from a gesture and transform it into a final drawing. You know, it really, what it, you. The gesture is the beginning and exactly what we've been saying. You have to take in from the gesture, you combine the dealing with the simple volumes. Well, the volumes have to take and carry the gesture farther. You don't, one doesn't, they're not, they're not separate. The action of the figure is first defined by your understanding of the action. And then it's defined a little bit more clearly by the, the masses of the forms that you're dealing with. And then finally, on top of that, you're taking and dealing with the rendering, the sense of light and everything. But you, nothing can destroy the thing before. You cannot destroy the sense of the action by the how you render. That's my, right. you know. Yeah, if you're running it, you know, so many people will complain and saying, you know, every time I, I do the details of my gesture, it stiffens up. Well, those, that's, those are the things that you need to watch out for. You don't want, it's like Glenn was saying, you don't want, every, every step should build upon the step behind it. It shouldn't cover it up. And so if you're, if you're getting into details that are destroying the gesture, then, then kind of reanalyze what it is that you're doing and make sure that, that that gesture, that fluidity, that spirit is still coming through in the drawing. Um, our next question here is coming from Mark who's uh, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about getting a sense of life and character into your drawings. That, for me, that came afterwards. Once I understood the animals, um, it took time, you know, because in the beginning, I'm spending so much time on trying to understand the three-dimensional form of the animal. Um, a lot of times I was forgetting about the spirit in there. And, but there's, you can come at it from just the spirit side of it too and not necessarily draw accurately, but then you can build the accuracy into it. Um, I would go back and forth sometimes. But for me, um, it, was, it, it was just a step at a time. I would, um, more often than not, it's trying to understand that anatomy in the three-dimensional form and how it moves. And then once that became a little more uh, uh, second nature to myself, then I was able to concentrate on getting more of the spirit and the personality. <clears throat> yeah, I uh, exactly. Now, one thing that uh, starting out, I will first, of course, getting the gesture and the action, but I will sacrifice accuracy for the feeling. 
I'm not, you know, I, I'm pretty accurate, but I, I don't worry about this. But, that, you know, at 84 years old, I've been doing it for a couple of weeks. So, <laughs> but at the, even at this point now, I have, I force myself not to get bogged down. You've got to get the feeling first. You've got it. That's, there's no way around that. And there's lots of academic dead drawings. You've got to get the feeling. Our next question is coming from Madeline, who's asking that uh, you mentioned using video reference for drawing animals. Uh, do you have a specific resource that you use? No, not really. I mean, back in the day, it was VHS tapes, you know, and now it's, you know, you can, you can go anywhere. And for me, I, and I, there's another thing that I've been doing, which is, um, you know, live webcams, like during the salmon season in Alaska, I can't be in Alaska, but I can, I can go to Brooks Falls webcam, which is at Brooks Falls, and they have a camera set up, and I can watch live grizzly bears catching salmon, and I'll sit there, and I'll sketch <laughs> watching them on my computer, so there, I mean, there's just, there's countless resources out there, whether it's YouTube, or webcams, or whatever it might be, um, once again, to me, that's a secondary uh, choice to seeing those animals live. But like, you know, if you can't do that, then yeah, there's, there's so many resources out there for video. Yeah, I, I, absolutely the same thing. <clears throat> Draw from life when you can, uh, and then use the camera as a uh, tool. Everybody's got their cell phone. <laughs> you, you're never really without a camera today. And so no matter where you are, use it as a, as a quick sketch type of thing that you can then use as a resource to work with. Similarly, we have another question from McCodine, who uh, mentions that they own some high quality sculptures of animals and they tend to draw them from different angles. They're wondering if that's a good idea or if that's a waste of time. I think it's a great idea. Anytime you can get resource, get a resource, um, and learn from it, that's that's great. I don't think, it, no, nothing like that is ever a waste of time, not at all. Yeah, I, I agree. And one suggestion I would take is the, <clears throat> when they're drawing from that sculpture, then to take them, have them do another drawing where they say, move apart, move ahead, turn it, and see if they can uh, go beyond just copying. Uh, we have another anonymous question. Maybe you guys already answered this when you suggested dogs and cats, but they're asking if you're new to drawing animals from life, is there an animal that's maybe simple or doesn't move a lot that you recommend starting with? <laughs> well, that's sort of what we do. We are <laughs> <laughs> the cats. And one, one thing you deal with is you have to, uh, when I think of the dogs and cats, cats are flexible. Dogs aren't anywhere near that flexible. A cat, you can throw it over your shoulder. It's not <laughs> going to do that very well with the dog. So you have to understand the, the difference between the animals and their flexibility when you start dealing with them. Yeah. Yeah, same thing. And uh, yeah, I mean, it can be as simple as drawing your goldfish. I don't care. I mean, as long as you're drawing something and observing and watching it, you know, you can find surprising uh, complexities in, in any animal that you decide to look at. So um anything you got around the house is going to help you <laughs> yeah, get a get a mouse <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> so it well, sounds like what the best animal to start with is whatever's closest yeah exactly exactly I, you know I've, i can't tell you how many times i've you know i find a bug outside or a cockroach or something like that and bring it in and sketch it it's just, it just anytime you do anything like that you're learning something you're building up some some you know, some yeah. visual library, some visual information. Yeah, draw. <laughs> That's the big deal, just draw. Yeah. Uh, this next question from Fish is asking, how do you get your quick sketches and gesture drawings to look so clean? They always feel like theirs are extremely messy and full of lines. Go ahead, Glenn. Okay, well, my, my sketches don't look that clean. <laughs> So when I start out, they're very loose, very free. There's lots of lines. I was teaching a class in Tokyo and one of the uh, students in the class was a teacher 
and who had been trying to follow some of my stuff. And the word, what you get, she says, they don't like those messy drawings. Don't look at the drawings of Daumier, look at Delacroix. They're free and loose. Don't think of it as messy. Just your drawing, you should be to the, every stroke is you're trying to feel it and understand it. And it should be the point, you're not scribbling. There's a difference, it's difference between scribbling and drawing. Right. And I think that's the key. It's just, you know, try not to scribble. Try to, you are going to search. I mean, we all search. I was just looking at some of my, I have some gesture drawings in here. Of, of, uh, I went to a, an animal center and they brought out lots of different animals for us to sketch and you know piles and piles of drawings like this but there's still you know once you once we started getting used to the animal then we started to you know you could draw it a little bit more accurately so it takes time you know instead of doing you know this all the time i'm sitting there watching looking and i might put a line down on a line but just work out your shapes think about those shapes first and then uh, that'll be you know it'll be less sketchy. We used to, the simple cliche was three looks, two thinks, one application. <laughs> there you go. And it's, it's another, and not, a, a big part of it is time. It's like Glenn said, he's been doing it for a few weeks and I've been doing it for a few weeks as well. So, um, you know, if you, you do it a lot, you'll get better at it. Uh, David from the chat is wondering if you have different kinds of approaches when you're sketching or drawing animals from life. Uh, specifically regarding dealing with their movement? I approach it the same way every time. That way I'm not reinventing the wheel. Yeah, that's one of the basic things I think. The way, just if you if you think you can be working with a brush, you can do everything, but you're always looking for the same thing. Right. And you can, you can focusing on the gesture, well, you can do that with a brush, you can do it with a pen, you can do it with markers, and you can do it on an iPad doesn't yeah. matter it's the same there's the tools are different but the, the logic and the process is the same now this next question is kind of fun uh kathleen wants to know if either of you have any memorable experiences on safari or on a farm when drawing animals i've got too many to actually recount for you guys <laughs> i've got amazing uh ones i've been charged by elephant i've been threatened by a lion i i watched uh, a mother grizzly with two cubs battle an entire uh, uh, pack of wolves over a, a moose kill in person in the wild. I've just, I've had so many incredible experiences. And that's, that's one of the things that I think is so important about trying to get out there, especially if you want to be a serious artist in, in regards to, to drawing animals and nature is to be out there because once you're out there, when you're pushing yourself out there, you're gonna go through so many experiences that you never expect. And it's just gonna, it's just gonna color your life in such a way that you just, it's, it's just amazing. So I, I've had a lot of great experiences. Yeah, I have, can't say I've done anything anywhere really long, what error it is going <laughs> to. I've, that hasn't been my main focus. Animal drawing is just another element of what I do, but having having horses and sitting there and uh, working, sitting in the corral with the horses and drawing them, that's it's so much fun just sitting there and being involved with the animals. And like I said, we had these goats, sitting here with these goats and trying to get them, keep them from eating your drawing. Yeah. <laughs> But also, Glenn, just, I mean, outside of the animal drawing, I mean, the, the experiences that you've had on a global scale, I mean, just all the places you've been in the world because of your art and your art taking you there. It's just, you know, that's the beauty of what it is that we do, whether you're drawing figure or drawing animals, it just takes you to so many places and so many experiences, whether, you know, it's with you, like if, if it's in Japan or Greece or wherever it might be, it just, it, it just takes you everywhere. Uh, similarly, McCoding's asking if you have any uh, stories from times where they brought animals for you to draw at Disney. <clears throat> well, I mean, the, the, you got to keep in mind when they're bringing animals in at Disney, they better be really well behaved or there's going to be some insurance problems. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there really wasn't too many big experiences. I mean, 
it was neat though because you know you bring lions in or you bring bears in the case for brother bear um yeah you get a chance to touch them and feel them and hold them and and you get a sense of what you know that that spirit that's in them but um beyond that uh there weren't any big incidents or anything like that no yeah, I, uh, they had me come down to Orlando a few times to take and uh, do animal drawing. And I yeah. remember one of the uh, directors, I think it was a director, maybe just an animator, had his, his big dog. And, oh. uh, his wife was with his, managing his, this big dog sitting on her. <laughs> and I, it, was, it was hilarious. It was just fun. That's great. When you start dealing with these again large animals. Why the animals that I've dealt with have been, you know, domestic. Um, also, uh, taking and uh, at at the studio in Disney, uh, we brought in a bunch of these ducks and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, that it's always it's just, it's fun. Yeah, it and is. You have to you have to have fun doing it, or it's no point in doing it. Exactly. Our next question is from Ali, who's asking. How much do you think drawing over an animal reference photo helps when comparing to observing and then drawing? Uh, I guess they're asking, is it useful to, to draw over reference photos as well? I'm sure there could be a benefit of that. From my point of view, I, I, I would avoid that. Yeah. Trace, I don't know that you're gonna get a lot out of tracing over photographs as much as you're gonna get from you know drawing from life or drawing from video, like I said. but. Um, uh, I mean, you're always going to learn something just by in the act of drawing, but I would say that tracing photographs is probably the, the bottom of my list of things to do. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, I, I basically don't trace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, I don't think it's a good idea. We have a really unique question from Marina here. I'm not sure if you will be able to answer it, but uh, they're asking, do you have any advice for people who are looking to incorporate art into their non-art profession? Uh, they say they work in the Arctic and remote communities as a planner, but they can't think of a meaningful incorporation. That's a big philosophical question. Wow. Um, that's one I'd have to, I don't have an off the cuff answer for that. That is a, that's a tough question. Um, uh, if you're drawing, then you're doing it essentially for yourself. And if somebody else can, you can bring it into another environment. You're just showing them a little of yourself. But yeah. uh, I don't, uh, I don't know how you would take and uh, start to talk about that because uh, if you're going and bring it into a corporation, and then you're talking business. You're, there's a whole different environment type thing. Uh, this next question is asking: uh, Is it possible to talk about your personal experiences that turned you towards art? Um, and what helped you go in, the, in that path? I've never done anything else. <laughs> 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 well, I, my, my, my father was a Sunday painter. I, uh, my grandfather was trained as a, as a uh, stonemason and sculptor and cutter. Uh, my grandmother did things. I've never really done anything else. Everybody kept saying, well, you should become a doctor or a dentist, but <laughs> that's not yeah I just don't yeah yeah for me it's like breathing it was just it's not even something i i've ever it's like the question was you know what are some of the things that have turned you towards art i, I was always turned towards art i think i can't i can't remember a time that i wasn't wanting to draw or paint or make a living at it and i had very supportive parents in that way because you know they were both artists and musicians and and so when I wanted to be an artist, there was no pushback at all. So I, I was just, it was, there was no doubt that, yeah, it's just like breathing. I, I, I can't imagine yeah. anything else. Um, and they have a second part of the question, which is uh, what is your advice for people who have the same uh, passion for drawing, but are just starting off? Keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving it word for word. Exactly. Keep doing it. Cause yeah, I mean, yeah. You did. You can't look at the, 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 a, a young artist asked Michelangelo for advice. And what he said was, draw. Yeah. And then added to that, don't waste time. Right. Yeah. You know, I just really, it, it, it's, I, I, there's another lecture that I do called Persistence of Vision. And it's a talk about 
basically how I got into what I'm doing now. But it really came down to, I was just a kid that loved to draw. That's yeah. all I did. And that persistence of wanting to create art opened up my chance to go to college and learn more art. And then I persisted in that. And that opened up a chance to work at Disney. And so, you know, it's the persistence of just doing it over and over and over again and learning that's going to open doors and, and create opportunities throughout your lifetime. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. And our final question for today's session comes from Martin, who wants to know, how long have you known each other and how did you guys meet? <laughs> We've known each other for years, uh, pretty much through Disney and then outside of Disney. Yeah, we sort of... Uh, We've been crossing paths for quite a while. Yeah, it's, it's probably the last eight or nine years that you and I have actually become close friends. We've known each other, known about each other for a long time. Um, and, uh, but then we, we really started talking and, and uh, you know, coming together in, in this, in some form or another over the last eight or nine years. Uh, well, that reaches the end of our questions. Uh, Glenn, Aaron, if there's like some uh, last minute things you guys wanna talk about before, before we end today's session. Oh, gee, no. <laughs> it's, you know, when we're through here today, I'm probably going to take and go down to the corral and draw. <laughs> <laughs> we're taking, I'm always constantly, I've got uh, the studio set up in such a way that I'm taking and constantly making videos. I'm doing this. It's, uh, you know, I'm theoretically uh, uh, retired 20 some years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Except I'm working harder now than I ever have. Yeah. Uh, it's exactly. just, but what we do is fun. It's not work. This is fun. And we, we are so lucky to be able to take and do what we do. And I, I have to admit that what we're doing today now with Tina, she, she's been the marvel that the whole thing that she set up with CTN. That, uh, we owe Tina an awful lot for the industry that we're in. And uh, it, it, we're very fortunate that, that she decided to take and uh, burden herself <laughs> with it so much because she's created so much work for herself. I, I just sort of sympathized with her and I said, oh my God, you know, how can you be doing all this? Well, I'm here and I wanted to say thank you very much for saying that. It's my pleasure. I absolutely love doing this. If I didn't, um, I don't know what to say. I just love it. I can't stop. I can't thank you enough. I'm honored that you would do this. Uh, it was an amazing kickoff session, Glenn, for your series. Thank All you right. again. Have a great rest of your day. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you.